And because of the variety of different places we've done this work, um, and the fact that I'm a Catholic, um, I, you know, I was giving lots of thought to sort of restorative justice in the Catholic Church. Um, I, I, the, it's interesting because the church and the bishops conference have always been very strong on restorative justice in terms of dealing with offenders. Um, and so in most of their documents on criminal justice, you'll find language about restorative justice and, and they've been supportive. It, but it turned a little bit when it got to applying it to them, <laughs> the bishops. Um, it, there wasn't exactly um, widespread support for it. And I've talked to a number of people around the country because I gave speeches on it for a while. Um, and people would say, well, the, our particular diocese doesn't want us to do anything. And, and so I had conversations with the Milwaukee Archdiocese. And um, the victim services person and I talked about doing a circle, but a circle that would be used for creating a film that would promote dialogue. So it, we, I put together as many people as I could sort of think of in terms of the faces of the various people that have been impacted. The film itself involves four survivors of clergy abuse. One is a priest himself. One is a woman whose son committed suicide over it. One is a woman who was um, sexually abused at age 12 and then really um, re-victimized by the church, by the pastor, and then by her parents. Um, and a, a man who was put in an orphanage with his brothers and many of the boys in the orphanage were victimized, including him. Um, so the, the first part of the film is the survivors. Then there are um, three people that are, or were or are involved with the church. The first one is a deacon who um, talks about an incident um, where he um, was a young youth minister in a pre priest made an approach on him and how he was never touched and he sa says it didn't bother me but it keeps coming up and, um, and especially when he's counseling other people and he also talks about the church not responding well to it and the pastor never checking on him after that but then he talks about being a youth minister in a parish where a priest was an abuser and his sense of was that abuse going on when I was leading to retreats with him and and, um, and the, the next speaker is a priest who was an offender himself, and he talks about that experience, and, and it was a long time ago, and now being removed from the priesthood. And the f last of the three men um, is a priest, an older priest, who talks about trying to explain why it is. It's, it is so hard for people to understand, and he talked about, he's on the review board, how when somebody does um, that we all do good in the light and evil in the darkness is really the theme. And that when people come forward and when there's been a complaint and say, but Father's done this and he did that and he's a wonderful guy and he, how could you think this? And he said, those people can be speaking 100% the truth, but that's not the question. The question is how do you give voice to the one person who may know what happened in the darkness? It is a fabulous film. And it really, the viewer, it's as though the viewer is sitting in the circle with the people and it invites the audience or whoever's watching it to sort of go into then a dialogue of their experiences. So it almost opens up the circle to the people that are watching it. So that is that is an exciting thing. It took me two and a half years of work to, and fundraising and things to get it put together, but I'm excited about that. Um, and it, it now has its own website, which I do know, which is uh, healingcirclegroup.com. The other um, major project we've been involved in is a project called Safe Streets uh, Initiative. And um, it, that was part of a two and a half million dollar grant through the Department of Justice. <clears throat> it has three components. One is law enforcement, prosecution, um, the second one is community, and the third one is corrections. And there are lots of different pieces to it, but um, our sort of justice initiative um, was asked and we took, we contracted to do the community piece. And so we're doing community meetings, um, and we've had ma the mayor participate, we've had the police chief participate, we've had community, the, the thrust of it is community coming in in circles, in other environments to say, particularly to offenders, whether it's re-entering from prison or whether it's guys who've committed crimes but the police chose not to charge and we're putting them into this program, that the community says we're not going to tolerate crime. We got to, you know, I live in this neighborhood, there are gunshots all the time, my kids are afraid to sleep in their own beds, whatever it is, and we're not going to tolerate it anymore. But we want you to make it. So we're here to help. But if you do not want the help and you commit crimes, you have to answer to us as well as to the police. And so and we're doing circles involving 
we always have police in the circles and offenders and victims and faith community and community-based organizations and people from the suburbs and we try to get, we run two, we have two police districts. One is primarily African-American, very high crime rate, and the other is Hispanic, also crime, high crime rate. And uh, we run two circles in each of the two communities, invite people in. And then our coordinators are doing other kinds of things like training people in schools. Um, uh, my Southside coordinator, Paulina Dehan, actually, um, after doing one of some reentry circles, some of the gang members, not the same gang, wanted to continue doing circles, so she facilitates those circles and actually had um, two guys apologize to each other for shooting at each other on the streets. Um, she facilitated a circle involving about six or seven police officers and high-end juvenile offenders, um, which became very intense. It was a four-hour circle. and But by the end, the, the kids, we're saying, okay, you cops are okay, but not the others. And so, you know, which is obviously what we do one by one. And uh, we just have some awesome stories from, from offenders and from police and from victims. And um, the crime rate has dropped in Milwaukee. Um, the police chief takes full credit for it, and that's fine. I, I think our community building is part of that picture. And, and uh, I know the community police relations are better in the neighborhoods we've been working than they were before. My restorative justice course, I've got 24, usually 24 to 28. Um, and I have, through the years, um, got them more involved in at least one project. Um, so even though it's sort of a classic course, um, I have them try to find, whether it's doing a restorative process in an in a elementary school classroom or some community group. I had one student last semester who went into a church in, a, in an impoverished Hispanic neighborhood and met with um, child, girls, 16-year-olds, um, who wanted to talk about sex abuse. Um, and, and so anyway, they, so I've got those 24 doing a variety of projects. And then my clinic varies anywhere from six to 10 students. Um, and then I, once I've had them in clinic, I never lose them. So then I've got these sort of volunteers that stick with me till the end of law school because once they start doing this, they, they never want to stop. But you know what I tell them, and it's part of the leadership training, is that it's not a thing and it's not a job. You can use these processes in no matter what environment you go into. You know, so all the, I mean, I always emphasize, you know, people say, what does restorative justice do for X? And my answer is, it doesn't do anything for X. It's a process. It's a method of methodology of dialogue. That's why I like to have my students doing it in all different environments. Um, you know, whether it's, uh, we did a circle, a couple circles with heads of community-based organizations on burnout. You know, and, and just to have them talking to each other and have them share sort of their passion for their work in a non-competitive way. So the answer is no, save for mediation. So we have, we're, we're ranked, I think, sixth in the nation on our mediation program at the law school. And we have lots of courses. And most of our students, the high majority of them that are really following that track, will not become mediators when they get out of law school. But they have some incredible skills, um, whether, whatever they choose to do. And they can also do the pro bono work that they're continuing to do it. So, I don't hold, I don't tell them that they're, you're going to get a job in restorative justice. Now, that being said, we have a district attorney in Milwaukee who's very proactive. He has three full-time DAs now doing restorative justice work. Um, he has his community prosecutors very much thinking restorative. So that's the kind of thing they are opening up. And I think for, for our students, and I tell them whether they're go, interested in becoming a public defender, a criminal defense lawyer, or a prosecutor, they ought to have restorative justice and understand how that fits into the system. Um, it is really the reason, and I wrote an article on this, but it's really the reason I, one of the reasons, I teach restorative justice to law students. Ultimately, so much of these systems are controlled by lawyers and judges. And if we don't, if lawyers and judges don't understand it and how it fits into it, um, systems are, are, are tough to change. And we hear that at the conference that we're at. People saying, well, how do you get, how do you get them here? How do you get them involved? And, and that's why I think it's just, it's so critical that law students um, have that exposure and understand that. And then when they go out with it, you know, I want people working in the largest corporate law firms to understand about problem solving, restorative work, and, um, and mediating, because I think they'll be better lawyers for it and better counselors 